Thank you. Um, I'm based at the Institute for Development Policy and Management at University of Manchester. Um, and my talk is on really trying to learn from the East Asian experience. Um, now, we've heard a lot of East Asia, I think, and, you, and, and when we're talking about Africa, East Asia always comes up as a comparable success story. Um, but I think it's with, worth revisiting, and, um, and my reasons are as follows. Um, I know you're all aware that there is an increasing trend of deindustrialization, not just in the third world countries, but also in advanced economies. And there's a great debate as to whether this is desirable or not. Um, but I think there's a compelling case, especially for developing countries, to keep manufacturing going and keep manufacturing alive and make difficult investments in manufacturing. And I think that's what the UNU wider conference has been all about. I mean, Danny Roderick, John Page, um, John Sutton, they've all made a very strong case for industrialization, particularly um, in building a strong manufacturing base. So we really need to think up ambitiously about how to build productive capacity in Africa. The problem with industrial development literature is that much of the discussion has been on industrial policy, particularly trade policy, but also technology policy. Um, and the emphasis has been on FDI as a source of technology transfer, spillover, and so forth. And these discussions have taken the form of state versus market debate, which you're all probably very familiar with. The neoliberals would argue that you need market-friendly policies to attract as much FDI as possible. And this is the whole doing business report by the World Bank and so on. The critiques of this approach, particularly state interventionists, would say this is a very minimal approach. Uh, it's a do-no-harm approach, but it's not how you catch up with more developed countries. And in order to catch up, you need to make strategic investments. So you need not only uh, protectionist trade policy, if it comes to that, you also need um, subsidies, and you also need a very selective approach to inducing and ensuring that FDI actually translates to economic growth. Now, my view on these debates is that it's run its course. I think there's now a fair amount of understanding that, yes, markets can be efficient allocating mechanism of resources, but then, especially in the catch-up phrase, the state really needs to play an active role in coordinating economic activity. So the motivation behind this research, this paper that I've, I'm pr about to present, is about, well, you know, let's, tr let's think about different theoretic lens out there to look at industrialization. Um, you know, and let's go beyond specific policy, talking about you know, what policies are, are appropriate, because ultimately that's very context specific, to thinking about more ambitiously, what are the structural conditions that are required to build a strong manufacturing base? And how does one, after building these, these institutions, enable these institutions to be flexible enough to shift so that the firms can actually upgrade with upgrading of institutions? So that's really the motivation behind this paper. Now, which begs the question, I said I wanted to bring new theory, new concepts with it, um, which begs the question, well, what theory then? Um, since I think really the 1980s, when there's a rediscovery of institutions and the part of development studies community, there, in the new institutional theory has developed significantly and made a lot of leeways. Now, institutional theory of the firm has really written the way of these theoretical advancement. Um, and in a, nutshell, it's, in a nutshell, it's basically two theories that have come together, or two bodies of literature that have come together. One body is the comparative political economy, also known as comparative capitalism literature. Um, the other side is the strategic management literature. Now, the comparative political economy have been very good at looking at institutions, particularly national level institutions, why they differ across countries, how they differ, what kind of impact this has for economic growth. Whereas strategic management literature has been very good at understanding the firm and the dynamic firm capabilities, how firms um, are able to, to build a capacity to learn and to upgrade um, as they develop. So bringing these two literatures, institutional theory of the firm tries to explain how national level institutions 
enable firms to develop and grow. For this set of literature, two area of focus is the financial system and labor relations. And that's because financial capital and labor are two of the greatest inputs when we're talking about firms. Right? So anything that affects the behavior of the financial capital, which is the financial system, and anything that affects the behavior of the workers or the labor, which has to do with industrial relations, labor market, um, what else? industrial relation labor market, skills and training and development. These are all clusters of institutions that institutional theory of the firm looks at. The key concepts here is that these, these institutional arrangements in the financial system, in the labor relations, have to coordinate and in some ways complement one another in order to enable firms to actually benefit from these institutions and on that basis build their firm capabilities. Now, the key thesis is that the leading firms, the good, the, the, the successful leading firms of, of any, any national economy, um, actually learn to bundle these institutions and make use of them to build their core competence. And they describe two dominant ways of doing so. One is the liberal or Anglo-Saxon way, and the other is non-liberal or organized or coordinated way, which is associated with the way Europeans manage their political economy, um, particularly in the northern European economies, Germany, also Japan. And I'll explain this bit more as I go along. Um, now, the theory is, 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 is a theory in development, um, and I'm not going to provide a whole critique of the institutional theory of the firm here. Um, but where it concerns this, this particular paper, and, and you as, as, as someone interested in development, is that these theories have been, these theories actually emerged from a very advanced setting, um, looking at leading firms in advanced economies, in particular the US, UK, Germany, and Scandinavia, and perhaps German, um, Japan a little. Um, so they emerged from these country contexts. They've been tested over and over again in these contexts. But no one's talking about developing countries or catch-up economies. And for that, the theory has to have more rigor. So one way of thinking, very easy way of thinking about it, is to start thinking about view of institutions, not as, as that which coheres, complements, and, and are always compatible, but a theoretic tool that can help us to look at incoherence, incompatibility, and think about, well, how did successful countries manage this incompatibility, rather than just you know, shelving it under the table and not looking at messy pictures of, of empirical reality in developing countries. The level of innovation has to shift focus as well. They've been interested in looking at research-based, really high end of innovation, whether that's radical innovation that enables exploratory learning or incremental innovation that encourages exploitative learning. Um, but we really need to shift to look at search-based innovation, innovation by imitation, and how absorptive and adaptive capabilities are built because these are the capabilities that developing countries need to, to build their base and upgrade and take advantage of foreign direct investment. Um, it also need, the theory needs to be more rigorous in understanding the dynamics change as well. Because they're looking at stable institutions, they look at on-path incremental changes, small changes here and there. But many of the developed countries, when they do change, it requires structural adjustment, it requires structural transformation. So it has, it has to be rigorous um, enough to encompass both path shifting change as well as on path incremental. Now I'm not going to resolve all the problems that institutional theory has, that wasn't the purpose of the paper, but it's to highlight that these are the elements that one should look out for um, when one is applying institutional theory of the firm to look at, for instance, East Asia and how it has developed. So I used comparative historical analysis um, to look at this. I felt that East Asia was a very rich setting um, to be exploring the issue of firm capabilities. And although we've heard a lot about East Asia in terms of the state versus market lens, well, what does East Asia offer in terms of the institutional theory of the firm? If we were to apply a different set of theoretic lens, does it reveal something different that we overlooked? Um, so that was, that was um, 
what I did, I applied institutional theory to the form, its key thesis and concepts, and cross-traced um, the institutional development of the financial system and labor relations in the three countries that I looked at, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, over four or five decades. And try to see how their financial system, how their labor relations developed, and at what point, or if ever, their systems actually co-evolved co co and complemented one another as the literature suggests that it should if it's a successful economy. And I wanted, by doing this, to derive a structuralist, um, I suppose, interpretation without, well, structural institutional interpretation without being too structuralist. Um, and, and to think about how structurally endogenous firm capabilities can be built and upgraded. Um, taking into consideration that for catch-up economies, they're not there might not be those conditions that are set out in advanced economies. And some of what's required is substituting strategies, um, not to mimic the conditions really, but, but try to substitute in an innovative way um, and experiment with ways of substituting. Um, one of the things that I um, also was interested in looking at is um, the notion of upgrading structural inertia because the theory states that once once you gain competitiveness in certain field, then you get locked into that success, right? And it's about breaking that negative lock-in because once the firm stops being successful doing what it does, having done what it did before, we're all creatures of habit, how do you unlock the, the um, structural inertia? And in many ways, I think this is the question that we need to answer when we're looking at middle income trap problem. Um, a lot, of country, a lot of firms in, for instance, Thailand, Malaysia, and so forth, have never really jumped from the middle income status to high income status. There are only two countries in the world that have managed this. Um, do you know what, who they are? The hint is in the, in the presentation. Well, actually, South Korea and Taiwan. Um, well, Singapore, yes, but Singapore, and I, I, mean, I was talking to a colleague from Singapore there, Singapore and Hong Kong are city-states, um, so we tend to leave that out because they, um, although they do have some manufacturing base, it's not as, a, as, as, as big or strong as, as I suppose you would see in South Korea and Taiwan. So South Korea and Taiwan are the two countries that actually have historically, um, looking at um, um, the world history, that have actually managed from a catch-up status to a high income. Uh, from coming from low income to middle income to high income. So uh, structural inertia is another element that I wanted to study um, in this research. So what does Japan tell me um, when I, I cross-trace their institutions? Um, well, Japan is often compared with Germany um, as having an incremental innovation capacity, being really good with exploitative firm capabilities uh, associated with quality manufacturing, that they're making really good at R&D in incremental um, innovation. And it's not surprising that Japan is so good at a lot of things that Germany is good at. And if we think about transportation, heavy machine tools, these are all incremental innovation industries um, that Germany excels in, and so does Japan. Um, and it's not so surprising because there was a transfer of institutions from Germany to Japan in the 19th century. J Japanese heavily um, imported the German institutions, including the financial system and including in some ways the labor relations. Um, by financial system, I mean the kind of universal banks that you find in Germany, you find in Japan. They call it a principal banking system, but it's a relational banking system where, where banks actually um, have a long-term relationship with the firms that they're lending to and have, do have some say in, in a way, of, uh, I suppose, in the board, the board of directors would, would help to advise the CEO, for instance. So banks actually do have some say in the way the firms are managed and so on. So they're able to, because they understand the firm dynamics, what they're going through, the business cycles, the industry, and so forth, they are able to be quite patient in their nature as opposed to impatient, which is um, what you find in Anglo-American economies that are more stock market based. So Japan has a financial system that encourages patient capital. It also has a labor relations system that is micro-corporatist in the way that, um, that Japan has been relatively successful in, in incorporating labor 
into their development paradigm. And I'll, show, I'll say this when I look at South Korea and Taiwan, that the other two countries have been less successful where labor relations are concerned, and that has path-dependent effects. Now, because the Japanese have been quite quite good in incorporating labor, and that has to do with the fact that they didn't revert to authoritarianism, but maintained um, continuous development um, in deepening democracy. There is a lot of workers' commitment at the firm level. So they're not guaranteed the kind of rights that German labor unions at industry level enjoy, like co-determination, for instance, where German labor representative actually sits on the board of corporations. But there are certain guarantees at the firm level. For instance, the, the notion of lifelong pay, um, um, the seniority-based system, for instance, that all ties people to the firm, so that their destinies are tied to the firm. This enables workers to be willing to make investment in firm-specific skills that might not be marketable elsewhere, but knowing that they have employment with this firm for a prolonged period of time, they're willing to make that investment. So with these two conditions, patient capital and labor commitment, the management learned to bundle these institutions and create a setting where they can actually experiment with long-term strategies. And that, to a large degree, explains why they're good at incremental innovation. They have labor and capital that they are, are willing to go with, um, to trust the management to experiment on, and fail and learn from failure and then improve and so forth. Now, it's a very stable system, the system that I describe. And in some ways, the stability also, it's, although it served them very well and continues to, in a large degree, serve them well, um, the implication is that there, there is, there's a sense of structural inertia in Japanese firms. Um, and you know, we, it's no secret that Japan's been under recession for the last two decades now and haven't been able to change very much. And if you look at a lot of their institutional reforms, there's nothing really path shifting about it. Um, they do play around with a lot of macroeconomic policies and so forth, but there's really no structural transformation that really changes any of these institutions. Um, so in some ways, they, they are victims of their own success. At one point, it was very successful. It is no longer, and they need to shift, um, but they're not able to. South Korea presents a different challenge. Um, it imported a lot of Japanese institutions, and it mimicked lot of Japanese institutions, but it never really reaches that, that incremental innovation capacity that Japanese enjoy, uh, although they've been very good at nurturing their absorptive capabilities. And that has to do with labor relations. The fact that the state was able to control the banks and make it patient, and, and the state was able to some degree control the labor and, and keep the wages down, therefore making again a commit to the firm. But because there's no social compromise between capital and labor, this is, this is resting in a very a volatile um, institutional setting. Um, so the state coordination of the finance and the labor relations system, although in some ways had its advantages, because ultimately institutional complementary depends on co-evolution of two institutional arrangements. And underpinning that is the capital labor relations, the social compromise, which the Korean state bypassed, it never could attain the kind of in incremental innovation capacity that Japan attained. And in 1997, with IMF and structural adjustment and so on, it makes a, a, a radical shift to a neoliberal sort of institutions, a neoliberal um, model of capitalism. And it's not surprising that you see Korean firms doing so well now in radical innovation industries, competing directly with firms in Anglo-American um, um, Anglo countries, um, firms who are really competing in same institutional conditions and are bundling institutions in the same way to serve their um, core competence. Uh, Taiwan is a particularly different case in the sense that um, the Taiwanese government, um, the Kuomintang, when it went to Taiwan, had enormous state capacity, but very little capitalist and industrial base. So what it did was it started controlling firms um, directly. So you see a lot of state-owned enterprises, not enough the private sector. And in some ways, it's a benign neglect in the sense that SMEs um, in Taiwan have learned to be very flex flexible and gain adaptive capabilities because there's no patient capital, because there is no labor commitment. 
what they're dealing with is inpatient capital and what they're dealing with is um, labor market flexibility. So they're very good at adapting, uh, which is why they're very good suppliers for major corporations in the US, UK, and Germany, and Japan, and South Korea now. Um, but again, unless you make um, the kind of investment that, that I suppose Japan and South Korea makes in building the industry base and looking and, and incorporating SMEs in the financial system and labor relations, um, the, the outcome is really at, really at adaptive capability level at the moment. Now, the Taiwanese government is trying to build up the clusters and so forth, enabling SMEs to be better inserted into global value chains and upgrade within. But ultimately, um, this is a, a dependent market economy in the sense that it very much depends on the lead firms of advanced economies. Now, I've summarized the three pathways that they've taken. And, and um, I think in the interest of time, I'll just wrap up. So the findings is that um, you know, building endogenous firm capabilities, looking through institutional theory lens, requires more than just industrial policy, technology policy, trade policies, um, and that institutional conditions do matter in the way it shapes different types of capabilities. And I just want to end by a quote um, by Chalmer Johnson, who is a very well-read person, um, a Japanologist, a, a political economist. And he once stated that Japan's unique labor relations and innovative managerial techniques, the staples of Western journalism on the Japanese economy, may actually be insignificant and even counterproductive because they're missing from Korea and Taiwan with no noticeable effect on economic performance. They are missing in Taiwan and, and, and South Korea, but it doesn't have a, a noticeable effect. It has significant impact on the way firm of these two countries have developed and will continue to develop in the future. Thank you. Thank you.